here we have the Volvo XC90 T8 Inscription, mm. which is pretty close to the most expensive Volvo you can buy. Yeah, it's up there. I, I think we'd have to see the, the configure to see how high we can push it, but this is damn close. You're, you're up there. Yeah. And uh, in birch metallic for the outdoor color, which I actually really like, and it matches yeah. the interior nicely. It's, it's super... Yeah, especially with this wood inlay with the, the birch metal color and everything, it goes yeah. together pretty well. Yeah, and I think that's a good place to actually start with this car as we make our way towards traffic. Mm. Is it looks really good? Yeah. So the XC90 has been on the market for quite a while now. You'll see many of them on the roads, and yeah, the they, one like the 2015, I think, is when yeah. when this generation came. And out. it was like the pioneer for Volvo's entire design ethos that you see today across their entire line. Yes, for the the, the rebirth yeah. of Volvo uh, post Gili ownership. Yes. And, yeah, I mean, they didn't make many changes. They got a light refresh this year. Very subtle stylistically, but you'll still instantly recognize it as an XC90. Yeah, the biggest change, I think, is actually on the inside, which is the captain's chairs here in the second row. Yeah. Which have really nice things about them, and then some of those same things are really annoying. We have the new captain's chairs in the second row, which replace uh, a, a full bench-style seat that was there before. A lot of other SUVs you'll see on the market that do the captain's chairs all have armrests in the middle. And Volvo made yes, rather... the, the interior armrests. Because right. you got the doors where you can put your arms. Right, and you have areas great. where you can walk through. And generally, they do one of two setups. Either put a, actually a middle console in there for your drinks and things. Yep. Or you have a walkthrough area, but you still have the fold-down armrest attached to the chair. Yes. Right? And this is a, a bold decision to not go with it. And at first, when you get back there, you have you know one arm on the door, and you're like, this is great. And you go to put your other arm arm down and there's no place there's no place to put it great yeah, yeah. it's not it's not there um and so i asked volvo about this and they said it was a decision made to make ingress and egress from the third row easier yeah and i will say they have succeeded there ingress and egress from the third row is greatly eased it is actually getting back there wasn't so bad and i'll say compared to the other alternatives especially the cars that have like the bench or the console in the middle, Yes. that third row becomes more usable for a tall person because you can stick your legs between the second row seats. Yes, um, and there's quite a bit of room. So if the front passengers slide forward a little bit yeah. and then the second row seats are actually on sliders, manual sliders, mm -hmm. they can slide forward a little bit. Um, it makes the third row rather accessible even for an adult. I wouldn't want to go on a road trip back there. I but would, on a twenty-minute drive to yeah, a restaurant, I would say about twenty minutes would be my my upper limit on where I would be. I wouldn't. Back I there. wouldn't love being back there. No, for for a while. But um, I would love being back there a lot more than I would in other cars of this sort of size. Um, and I think it's because Volvo, and this is true in the second row too. They've sort of raised the the seat up a little bit and then left a, an opening in the floor. So the floor yeah. is a little bit lower than you might expect in the second and third rows. So you have a place for your feet to go. Yeah, and so that, that pass-through does solve a lot of problems for the third row of feet. I will say I sat back there, and as a six-foot-tall guy, my head did hit the roof. Um, it's a concern if you have real full-size adults, but those guys are probably not going to be in the third row anyways. It's mostly for... Child, children. Yeah, the kids and, are going to go back and, there um, or picking the kids up at that soccer game or they have their yeah. friends or whatever. But if you did have to cram people in for a, uh, for a emergency run to the airport or who knows what, yeah. uh, you could do it. I will say that the third row, when the third row is up um, and it's a mechanical folding, there's no electric yeah, folding back there. which is a little, a little bit. Um, yeah, okay, fine. Um, but when you're when you're back there uh, and you have the third row up, there is very little luggage room. Yeah. Um, basically, you could fit a backpack um, depth-wise or uh, maybe a couple of, like, rollerboard suitcases, things like that, but not much else. You're not taking six people and their luggage to the airport. No, you're not. You could take four people and your luggage because once you sure. fold those third rows down, plenty it's the, there's yeah. plenty of space back there. Um, so, but that is also true for basically every car in this segment. You either get so, people or cargo. One of the both. things that I do appreciate in this is, you know, I'm always thinking about ski vehicles because I'm a winter ski person and actually not having those center armrests, if you wanted to put skis straight down the middle, Throw them right you up. could take four people and all of their gear and then and some. And skis and all oh, of yeah. things. Oh yeah, it would Well, given that hard. this is Swedish, yeah. it says right there on the, on the seat, got the little flag in case yeah. you uh, 
forgot that this was Swedish. They know about skiing. Yeah. Yeah, they do. Um, yeah, so you can do that, uh, and then you have the seats, and, and those, the second row seats fold down flat as well, so you can, you know, get interesting cargo-y things going on there. So, you know, that that's sort of the, the interior in the back half of the car. Yeah. Um, we should say this version of the inscription does have uh, heated rear seats in the second row. Sure. Which is nice. If you're hauling kids all the time and you want their butts warm. Yeah. It's easy in a lot of vehicles. They get accustomed to a certain lifestyle. Yeah. That's you gotta, what it is. You got to do it. Um, as for the... Uh, oh, one other thing to note about the second row is we'll, we'll do a shout out to your wife here. Mm. Who she said she back, sat back there. She has had like neck surgery and all kinds of back things. And she said she sat back there while her neck was hurting and it made her neck not hurt anymore. Volvo is known for very supportive seats. That is yes. one of their hallmarks. Volvo like, that's has no real surprise. Maybe the best seats I've sat in this side of a hundred thousand dollars. Yeah. Um, and even then, I've sat in some expensive cars that have terrible seats, and this one does pretty well. And even more importantly, I believe Volvo is the only car maker to have an orthopedic surgeon on staff who helps with their with their seats. Yeah. Which is part of the reason why they are so freaking comfortable, and also <laughs> part of the reason why their headrests don't move. Yeah. Because when you have adjustable, movable headrests, they found people move them into the wrong place, and then, and then they aren't there to help you in the event well, of a crash. because people call them headrests, and that's not what they are. No, they are head restraints. Yeah. So those are very important. Um, in the front seats, which are even more superior to the mm-hmm. rear seats, uh, this particular version has heated and cooled and you can have them at, on at the both same time. on at the same time, which is <laughs> <awesome>. uh, irrationally <laughs> important to us. Um, they also have uh, adjustable lumbar support, adjustable side bolsters, and massage. Yeah, you get that roll. You get a back rub as you drive. I mean, the, yeah, I enjoyed it. We took yeah. this thing on a long drive last week, and it was nice. Really nice. Oh, I think we may be in a lot of traffic here because there goes a fire truck. And another, and another fire, fire truck. Mm. We should have bailed. Well, we're committed now. Enjoy the ride. <laughs> oh, he's going to be that guy. No, I'm getting out of the way of the fire truck. Oh. And another fire truck. All of the fire trucks. I don't know where he's trying to go. I could be that guy and drive that way. And here comes an EMS, and this is going to be all sorts of I fun. think I'm going to be that guy, actually. This is all on video. We're going to bail. Because it was going to be two guys sitting, going nowhere in traffic. Forever. (laughs) And uh, I also know that we're not going to get pulled over because uh, the police are all going to the crash. Yeah. This is going to be a good test of the all-wheel drive system. Well, I I also do want to get over to 3 North, so I have to wait for both lanes to clear. I think that's a pipe dream at this point. Oh, here we go. It goes just fine. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we want to be two guys sitting in traffic, not two guys stuck in traffic forever because someone rolled over. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, but of course, we, uh, they'll be fine. We, uh, yeah. So anyway, uh, we're not going to be two guys in that traffic. We're going to be two guys stuck in this, this traffic, traffic yeah. of which there'll be plenty of. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so you have the rear seat or you have the front seats and they are massaging and things. Um, which is all very nice, and they are extraordinarily comfortable. And more, more police cars. Something, something bad happened. Yeah, that was not a one-car accident. That was no. A- I think something, something very unfortunate happened up there. Um, so we're not going to go that way. Yep. And then uh, up in the front, yeah. uh, aside from the seats, you have some things that are really nice, and then some things that maybe are a little more controversial. Okay. Steering wheel. Terrific. Nice, no problems. Check the um, box. Yeah, you gotta, you know, these are a little cryptic um, because it's just an up and a down arrow, but those are for volume. Yeah. That button there does double duty. One, it's a mute button for the radio. So you tap yeah. that and the radio mutes so you can answer a call or whatever. And it also acknowledges things on the screen. Yeah, it's your selector button. Yeah, you get a little, little choice button there. On the left side, you have adaptive cruise and this has pilot assist. Yes. Which we can actually... We'll turn it on here. Yeah, so it's one select with a button to, to adaptive cruise yeah, on. Yeah, press and the middle button, and it turns on the adaptive yeah. cruise control. And then if you tap to the right, right, it turns on pilot assist, which is Volvo's version of Tesla's autopilot, Mercedes' intelligent drive, Nissan's pro pilot. 
Yeah. It basically combines adaptive cruise control and active lane centering yes. into something which, for a few seconds at least, you can be hands-off. It actually takes a lot of stress out of driving in traffic. I find myself driving with my pinky when you have a pilot assist on. Yeah, because what it does is it looks for a little bit of input from the driver to show that you're still paying attention. Yep. And so, yes, I'm still here. Um, just a little touch or a little bit of weight of your hand, something like that, um, will tell it that you're here. Just don't rely on it because, you know, for example, compared to the, Pro, the Nissan Pro Pilot Assist, which will actually bring the car to stop when it disengages, this just turns off and you're on your own. Yeah, this one just, uh, just if it's not sure you're there, it just gives up. And that is basically an accountability mode to say, you need to be paying attention, sir. Yeah. Or else we're going we're gonna to turn off. So Volvo's not going to be responsible for your behavior. Yeah. Um, whereas the, um, the Mercedes one will also uh, come to a stop in the middle of the lane, which I actually really like and I kind of wish Volvo had it. Because the biggest advantage to that is if you're having a medical emergency. Right. And you've, you've passed out or, you know, there's a whole number of reasons why, you know, have a heart attack or low blood sugar or any number of things. Um, and the car is perfectly capable of driving itself in the lane yeah. and bringing you to a stop. And so what Mercedes will do is it will uh, turn on the hazard lights if you don't respond for 30 seconds or a minute or yeah. something like that. Um, and then bring the car to a stop pretty quickly. Um, in, in the middle of the lane, which seems like a terrible idea to stop in the middle of the lane. Except but that's a much, all, yeah, it's a much better idea than careening <laughs> off into the barrier, which is far worse for everybody. Um, so that's a nice thing. And a little surprised Volvo hasn't done that. And I bet that sort of a feature is coming in like the next gen yeah. of pilot assist. And Volvo's been pretty conservative about rolling out the next generation of tech. So uh, we'll keep an eye on that. So that's the steering wheel. And then you can adjust the uh, the distance to the car in front of you. And I will say that it follows much more closely than it used to in prior versions, which is good for traffic like this, because if it left as much space as it did in like the 2015 I, I, version, yeah, okay. people would cut it. it. That's the f- generation this is a one. Little, this is generation two. Uh, I don't know. A prior generation. I don't know what they actually call it. but Yes, there's a, there is a one and a two. And the two, I find if you keep it on the closest setting, you really don't have any problems. It works yeah, it pretty seems well. fine. Because you have an XC40, which is yeah. basically running the same the exact sort same of software. driving the XC40 at the 2019 and this 2020 XC90. The pilot assist seems identical. It's got the same branding on it. If you have one, you have the other. There's a lot of similarities in the two. Yep, um, I don't think they're exactly the same. They said there's some minor tweaks for 2020, but nothing, nothing. Software. Major. Yeah, it's more. Changed. It's more other um, software things. I can't remember exactly off the top of my head what they are, but I know like in one of the updates they did. Um, there was a cross-traffic uh, auto-braking thing. So if you were turning left and yes. there was a vehicle coming, it would auto-brake for you to stop, okay. um, which is an interesting little bit of tech because, uh, you know, normally it's looking for a car directly in front of you that you're going to hit, but that's the automatic emergency braking. But to see a vehicle coming in the other lane, go in the other direction and stop yeah. you from turning in front of it, that's pretty clever. Um, that launched in, I think, the new XC60 in 2017. Okay. So, anyway, um, new tech is coming at all the time and all that. So, that's all good. Um, the instrument cluster, this has been around for a while. I don't think this has changed much since 2015. No, it's across, um, all across the whole model line if you have the full digital display. Yeah, full digital display. You got speed on the left, uh, digital and analog, and it shows you the current speed limit, which is nice. Um, at the top, you do get the outside temperature. <laughs> and if you go into the settings somewhere, it will show you the miles to empty. Yeah. Um, but I don't remember how to get it's there. It's in there with the trip computer. But yeah, yeah. It's, in the, it's in there somewhere. Um, and then on the right side, this is kind of interesting because we're in the T8 model, which is the plug-in hybrid version. It shows this weird display that combines the power from the electric motor with the one from the uh, gasoline-powered motor. And it just sort of says, here's how much power you're using which is not that useful. Yeah. But it does have, I really like, it's got a little lightning bolt, and that's filled in when the electric motor's going. And then yeah. it's got a little drop, which I assume is a drop of oil. I would assume. And when that's filled in, the gasoline motor is on, which is not right now because we're on the electric. And we've been driving this whole time on electric, huh. which is pretty good. Um, this one has a slightly bigger battery in the 2020 T8 yeah. um, XC90 than it did in 2019 and previous. Um, and basically they took the same amount of space for the packaging and they stuffed slightly more cells into it. So the battery got a little bigger, just over 20 miles according to the EPA numbers. Yeah. For, for total electric range, which is pretty good. Which gets you a partial 
tax credit, not the full EV. Does not get you the full seventy five hundred dollar federal tax credit. It gets you five thousand ish, yeah. something like that, which is good. Um, so this car, uh, you can actually look in there. Right, you want to pull out the thing. Another note to open the glove compartment is that button. Yeah, there's a there's that a button. That took me a good two minutes to figure out. Yeah, it was hilarious. I watched. <laughs> so I think this is eighty seven thousand. Oh yes, sticker price is eighty seven. Just a hair under eighty six nine ninety. Yep. Uh, luxury package on that's thirty one hundred. Advanced package twenty four fifty. Inscription niceties sixty three hundred. With the base price for this model of the T eight of sixty seven thousand five hundred. Yeah, and I think that's about a ten thousand dollar premium or something over the T six. Ten thousand, eight thousand. Yeah, you can get into the fifties in the T six. Oh, that's, easily. Yeah, and you can get honestly, higher than that. let's. Uh, I, I meant that you can get you can get an equipped T six in the. 50s. Oh yes, yes, yes. Um, you know, honestly, that's a personal decision on whether you think that T eight versus T six. I the economics don't work out. I'll start with that. No, well, the economics don't work out on any car over forty five thousand dollars. Or so. No, but I mean, if you're looking at it from, from I, I, that. I argument. mean, the the upgrade cost from the T6 to the T8 to get the plug-in hybrid. You're not going to make that money back ever. Uh, maybe not at, eventually, may, may, if maybe you use the electric motor, ten dollars a, a gallon, but not uh, at American yes. two fifty. Yes, so it does cost. Um, you do get the tax credit. Um, you are slightly greener. You do get a little bit better overall fuel economy. Um, if you do a lot of short trips, especially because you go home, yeah. plug it in, charge up the battery, drain it down twenty miles, come back, charge it up again. Um, but it's not a Chevy Volt that's going to go 50 or 60 miles no. on a charge, and it's not a full EV like a Tesla or, or something and like that. And even versus being green, you might be green on the tailpipe emissions, but when, you know, a fundamental truth is that when you look at the price of a car, usually that price translates directly back to CO2 emissions. It took that much more energy to produce the vehicle, especially yeah. with batteries. So your net carbon footprint, when you consider production, is not going to be lower, even if your tailpipe emissions are. No, nah, we don't care about carbon footprint. <laughs> um, but I will say, the electric motor in this is pretty good. So this has an unusual setup, which you have some mixed feelings about, where the uh, it's got the yeah. same engine up front as the T6 uh, Volvos, which is a supercharged and a turbocharged okay. yeah. Uh, two liter four cylinder engine which is the that same, produces 300 and something horsepower. Which is the same engine block they use on all the Volvo engines, the physical block itself, whether yes. it's a T4, 5, or 6, or 8, they all have that same two liter displacement block. And the Diesel difference is. Diesel or regular. Yeah. 64% of it is shared across every different yeah. variant, um, which helps for cost savings. Yeah. So you get a far fancier, more complicated engine and uh, for less money. It helps for European tax implications where you're taxed on the cube of the engine. China as well. Does it that way? Yeah. Um, coincidentally, I guess that uh, they're doing it like that. So you have the same engine in this car. It only drives the front wheels, and then the electric motor. So you have the tunnel, which is where the normal drivetrain stuff goes on the all-wheel drive, yeah. filled with battery. And then in the back, driving the rear wheel, is the electric motor. Yeah. Between the electric motor and the internal combustion motor at the front, you get all-wheel drive, which they call e-all-wheel drive. drive. Right, and this is not unusual if you look at the Toyota Lexus hybrid systems for the all-wheel drive, they work the same way. Uh, the, the, you know, one advantage over those Toyota Lexus systems is that at least in this case, there is a generator, the alternator on board will provide continuous power to always have all-wheel drive in the back if you need it. That is not true of the Toyota Lexus system. Yeah, so you have a, a little button down here, so you can push that called drive mode, and you have constant all-wheel drive, which will just lock the uh, the ice engine on and the electric motor on, mm -hmm. and it will always have enough power to generate um, the that electric torque in the back. Um, pure will lock it in eco mode, mm -hmm. and will keep the electric motor running up to a pretty good, I want to say it's in, into the 70s of miles an hour. Okay. Um, but really, your most efficient is going to be uh, under about 40 miles an hour to run an electric-only yeah. mode. So if you're tooling around the city, you can just hit that and lock it into pure. Well, that, and that's a pretty, across all electric cars, you're Fuel economy tanks pretty be, quickly as you go well, up. Well, it's true of any car, actually. Well, You're, even an it, ice engine. It is pretty. It is true of any car, but it's now. especially true of electric because yep. at least with a with a you know, regular gas car, your efficiency of your engine increases with speed, and that eventually is overcome by the Air drag. Resistance and, yeah, yep. but with an electric, you're not getting that efficiency gain with RPM. So. Yep. Um, the only other things you have is individual where you can manually adjust some stuff. Power, uh, which 
gives you, uh, it's like a sport mode, basically. It's, it's constant all-wheel drive, but in sport mode. Um, and then off-road will uh, raise up the air yeah, suspension, because yeah. it's got air suspension, um, and uh, add a couple other things, traction, adjust the traction control, things like that, to make it a little bit better for, for off-roading. And it does give a very capable hill descent control function. So if you do find yourself off of the pavement, which I don't anticipate no, this car this, if, to do if, very if, often. If you are, it's going to be on like gravelly, you know, roads and the forest maybe. Yep. But, but if you are driving somewhere where it's a little more off the beaten path, you can yeah. go to off-road and it'll do that. But it only works up to a certain I, I would just give that like same, that. this goes back to the all-wheel drive system. So because it is battery based, you're not going to get more than... 80, 80 horsepower or so to that yep, back the rear engine. Wheel. A little more torque, so which is useful. So it'll get but... you unstuck, but it is not something for really. You know, yeah, it's not. Don't go. Don't drive up a sand dune. Yeah, that's not. It's not what it's meant. <laughs> it's not appropriate. If you want that, go buy a, a G class wagon. You know, a G class yeah. uh, AMG or something yeah. like that. Um, other cars that you shouldn't do that in is the Alpha Four C right there. So <laughs> say say that. Um, yeah. So you got that, and. Uh, so that's how that works. And then we have some things that are a little more questionable. We'll start with the big touchscreen, which I actually really like. Super controversial. Yeah. People either love it or hate it. I happen to really like it. Um, you have some neat things up here, like you have the different tiles. So you got one's the nav tile, and then you got a radio tile, and then you got a phone tile. Um, and then you have a tile for CarPlay or whatever other settings you need to adjust here. But the problem with this thing is your settings are all buried in swipes and Everything's gestures. digital, yeah. So if you want to, say, come over here and uh, turn the lane keeping on and off. Yeah. Right? Okay, that's not something you're going to do very often. So that's fine. I don't mind that those are buried there. You know, these are all settings. Turn the cruise control on and off. Turn on the active bending lights. The wiper service position. Yep. Where it brings those up so you can actually adjust them because they're tucked so far down there. It is. And the first time you can't that actually you, touch The them. first time you go to change your windshield blades, you're going to be like, why can't I lift this up? And then you're going to be like, oh, there's a swipe I have to do. Yeah. <laughs> um, other thing you have to know about your windshield wipers here is there are no windshield wiper, uh, windshield washer fluid nozzles. Mm. The windshield washer fluid actually comes out of tiny holes in the wiper blades. So you have to get special Volvo wiper blades to replace them. Otherwise, you can't wash your windshield. So see, oh, it, all, it all comes out of the comes out of the things. It does get you a much better wash of your windshield, especially at speed, because you aren't spraying right. windshield fluid all over well, the car behind what you. What will they think of next? So you know, when you get over here, right, it does mean the Apple CarPlay, for example, is a little bit tricky to get to use. You have to swipe and go in and go there, right? I mean, yes. there are... It is not the most intuitive thing in the world. And to then use. you get apps, yeah. which I'm, I don't think anyone's ever going to use. You've got no a Spotify app. No one ever uses those. And a Pandora app. Um, but you do have some neat things that are in here. If you go to car status, for example, it'll tell you about some messages. And you can uh, try and request an appointment for to change your oil or change your whatever right from here. Yeah. And it'll send a message to your local Volvo dealer, and they'll come back and say, oh, here, how does this appointment work? N and you can also send vehicle performance yeah. data to them if you're having problems. Another important point while we're here, the TPMS section, right? Yes. So something to know about with modern Volvos. They don't have TPMS sensors, those tire pressure sensors that you're legally required to have. Instead, they use wheel speed indicators, the same thing that works with your traction control, for example. And they measure the differential rotation of the various wheels. And if one of the wheels gets out of sync with the other four, they say, hey, you've got a flat tire. And that's that. There's no tire pressure It's actually pretty clever. So it's nice if you want to run a set of winter wheels because you don't have to worry about getting new sensors and swapping them over. Yes. It's great. I can do it in my driveway. The problem is when you have a flat tire, you have to go to every single one of them to figure out which is down. Well, it'll tell you which one is low. Uh, um, but you should check all your tires anyway. You, you should, should be a responsible person because we're all about safety here at Volvo. Um, everything in this car is designed with safety in mind. But you don't know whether you have a flat or whether you're just low. So in a well, car maybe you with, should go check it. A car with regular TPMS sensors, okay? Physical when, TPMS phys sensors. Physical TPMS sensors. You get a pound, you know, PSI rating. Yeah, it'll so say 37 or if whatever. If it's umpteen below, which, you know, this is New England, it gets to be umpteen below and your tire pressure goes low because it's cold. I can tell, oh, I'm only down a PSI or two because it's cold. I don't have to pull off the highway and worry about this. I'll deal with it when I get gas. With this, 
Yeah. <laughs> well, you'll find out if you're driving along and it pulls to one yeah. side or whatever. Um, but yeah, you, you know, so you do, you do have little things like that. But that's, you know, at the end of the day, check your tires if the yeah. sensor's low. Don't just let it go forever. Um, other things that you have to do with physical buttons, change the temperature. If you want to change the temperature, mm. you have to press the little button, which is always here. Yeah. It's a, this is a, a permanent soft button. And then adjust or scroll and then hit close again. It is more work. It takes your eyes off the road And it's a couple more a steps. Um, but really, they just want you to set it to auto. But for a safety-oriented brand, not touch it it's, it's a big omission because you, are, you have your eyes off the road for a second or two to do this. Let's be honest. Yeah, and I mean, it's something we could ask them, did they, did, and I would bet, knowing Volvo, if it was actually a safety concern, they wouldn't have done it. But I bet you they tested it. And they found that, oh, it's fine. I would guess, knowing Volvo, but I don't know. So you have the same thing with the heated and cooled seats. You have a permanent soft yeah. button here, um, and you got to hit them. And it does have a, a, a winter mode or something. I don't know what they call it. Um, whereas if it's really cold out, they'll turn on. Yeah. Uh, they'll turn on the heated seats automatically uh, if you had them on previously. You get the weird phone storage thing. I don't know. There's no good place to put your phone. We'll just leave it at that. You get a couple things. I like this little sliding thing. Yeah. That's really pretty when it's closed. But you're gonna buy it and then you're just gonna leave it open all the time. <laughs> um, start stop button. It's actually a knobby that you turn yeah. left and right. Drive mode. Parking brake. Auto hold button, great. And then we get to the part that is perhaps the weirdest part of this car. Mm. And that is the shifter. And it looks very pretty. It's the Aura 4's mm -hmm. crystal, which is a Swedish crystal which company. Which only comes on the inscription trim, I believe. Uh, the T8. Just the only T8? The T8s, only the okay. T8s get the crystal. That's the very fancy. It does feel very nice, considering you never touch it. But it is pretty, and it's lit up from underneath. So people go, ooh, ah. But we have a park button. Yep. So you press, press the button to go into P. And then if you get in the car and you're about to start driving, and let's say you want to back out yeah. of your driveway. That's what most people do when they get yeah. out, right? So on a normal car to back out, you pull from P and you pull backwards into R. Yes. You pull back one click. In this, you don't do that. No. You push it forward once. Does that put you into R? No. <laughs> you have to push it twice. Once to go into neutral, and then again to go into R. And then if you want to drive, you pull it back once into neutral and pull it back again into drive. Yes. So double tap forward into R, double tap backwards to drive. Anytime you shift it, you got to double tap. You got to hit it twice. So yeah. you have to be very deliberate about it. Otherwise, you just end up in if, neutral. If you're in sync, if you're in gear and you tap it once, neutral, right? No matter what you do. In any direction, you and oh, actually, no. If you pull it backwards and you're in drive, drive you, you go into B, which only on the T8. Only on the T8, and B is an extra braking mode. So yeah. it uses uh, simulated engine braking basically to slow the car down um, and charge the battery. Yeah. It's bizarre. Not the, is for bizarre. Not, no. not, the, not the, the engine braking mode, which is actually pretty common. It's this whole shifter. Speaking as someone who owns one of these cars with a double shifter, if it's your primary daily driver, you get used to it. If it's your spouse's daily driver and you get into this once a week, you every, once, every in while, once in a while, yeah, you find yourself in neutral. Yeah. S um, sitting in the middle of the road that you just backed into going, zoom, just revving in neutral. Oh, yeah. that wasn't good. <laughs> yeah, and, and this is, um, you know, we're, we're calling out Volvo a little bit because this is a little odd, but there are a lot of different versions of these. Yeah. Um, I just drove uh, at the, the Impa test days. Uh, they had a BMW X4 there, yeah. and the, it's the X4M, and the, the gear shift on that is incomprehensible because there's the regular pull it yeah. back to go into drive forward into reverse like this the, the wand yeah but then there's a p for park push button on the shifter and then you can go left or right to change gears and then on top there are two buttons that let you change the ferociousness of the gears shifting i, I played with that bmw shifter it's maddening it's, it's like a joystick it's crazy there's so much <laughs> going on there i don't know how people figure it out anyway so uh volvo it's it's not PRND. Um, I kind of wonder why they do the double tap. Just do a single tap. I don't know. But anyway, but it's there. 
it looks very pretty. It's a little odd to use. I think to your point, if you do drive it every day, it's not a big deal. Comes in sync, double, 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 double. You don't, you won't touch the shifter without double tapping in this because you'll just get used to it. Yeah. But if it's not your everyday car, like I said, if it's your spouse's car, you're just driving that day or whatever. It's a little weird. Yeah. Yep. So um, you have that, but at least it's very pretty. Other things you have that are very pretty, uh, the leather, extremely yep. good in here. It's leather everywhere, including this one, which has leather uh, visors yeah. and leather, uh, oh, crap handles, Yeah. which I don't know how I lived without <laughs> leather, oh, crap <laughs> didn't handles. Didn't even know you needed they, that? I didn't even know I needed it, but they are really nice. Um, and uh, other than that, you know, it's, it's gorgeous in here. It hasn't changed in a while. All of the Volvos basically you get the, the 40s, the 60s, the 90s, they all sort of have this same yeah, similar look. They, they have a very similar look. And thankfully, one of the advantages of this having been around a while now is reliability has gotten better with this vehicle. Yep. The current generation of XC90s, when it first debuted, had some rough times. Yeah, and that's true of basically any first generation vehicle, new platform, new engine, engine. new it everything. It was especially true with the XC90. Um, I had a review uh, XC90 that I couldn't, I opened the hood and then I couldn't close the hood again. I believe it. That was uh, that was a little awkward, and I thought I was going to have to drive around with the hood, like sitting on the lock, yeah. the secondary lock thing. But we got it fixed. Uh, um, if you look at reliability data from the last, now that these things have been out for a few years, we're up to about average, which is improvement. Yeah, for the for that segment, for yeah. sort of the luxury yeah. SUV. I mean, there's going to be problems because there's a lot going on in this car. I actually got a warning the other day, and it mysteriously fixed itself. Um, this has an external speaker for fake engine noise for when it's in EV mode, so yeah. pedestrians don't get pretty, run over. Pretty common. Um, but I had a, an error with yeah. the exterior sound. It's an exterior sound error. Please see your dealer immediately. And uh, But it fixed itself. A lot of old problems just go away. Yeah, just uh, any electrical problem in a, in a Volvo, it's just gonna go away. Yeah, that's exactly <laughs> that's how that totally works. That's totally how it's gonna work. <laughs> um, yeah, so I mean, other than that, uh, you've got three memory, see, um, things on each side, yeah. which is a little unnecessary on your side, but hey, why not? Um, yeah, other than that, uh, I, we could go into a lot of things about this car. It's the auto optimal. high beams are really good. The bendy the, headlights work well. The bendy well. headlights are extremely good. Yeah. Volvo, it goes back to what I said about everything in this car is here for safety. Headlights, very important. Yeah. If you drive at night, there's nothing more important than your headlights. If you don't believe me, turn them off. <laughs> and then see what happens. Um, yeah, they're very important. Um, yeah, I mean, other than that, you have, you know, the, the auto windshield wipers. The windshield wipers are really good. And that fancy windshield washer fluid out of the thing. Yeah. I thought that was super gimmicky. And then you use it and you're like, oh, this is pretty nice. And that's sort of a lot of things about this car. Is that you do stuff and you're like, oh, that's, that's kind of nice to it's have. Nice. It's nice. If you're looking for a car that's... Really? Unoffensive, comfortable, like nothing is really going to upset you about this. Yeah. It's a safe bet. If, if you go to Ikea and you say, I wish my car was like that, but a little more luxurious. Yeah. <laughs> you will be extremely happy with this car. Yeah. Um, rear view mirror is good. The 360 camera is good. The auto park in and out feature is good. That works very well. Yes. Um, all of that is great. The nav, uh, I, I, the nav isn't my favorite favorite, but I will say that when you use the nav, you get in the uh, in the little display yeah. here in the infotainment, or not the infotainment, in the, the dashboard display, instrument cluster, that's I mean, the word I'm let's, looking for, let's, is fantastic. Let's be honest, the nav search is awful. You want to find an address or a POI, it's infuriating. But a lot of car nav systems are that way. You know what you can do, though? If you <laughs> have the Volvo On Call app on your phone, you can share addresses from Google Maps yes. directly to the on-call app using the share function, and it will send it to your car's navigation. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Yeah. I use that a lot in my, uh, in my, my Volvo, which does not have CarPlay. Of course, now you just plug your phone in, and you CarPlay, and that's all you need. So the car, we should mention the CarPlay. This is true of most cars with portrait screens. You only get half the screen, and you have a ton of wasted screen space at the top there. Well, it is, it's it's half wasted, but then it's half, like, we're going to display stuff. No, but I mean, like, you, at least here, have, like, radio and stuff set in, right? When you're using your, like, Pandora through here, yeah. all of the say is 
phone via CarPlay, radio via CarPlay, everything via, via CarPlay. CarPlay. Yeah. yeah, one, two, three. That is really annoying because if you have the CarPlay up, you can't use the nav. Yeah. It doesn't let you. Yeah. Which is the, a boggling decision. <laughs> I don't know. Um, but you can go with the, like CarPlay setting. You get the yeah. digital owner's manual because clearly who needs that? I, I don't know. Um, yeah, so that's all that. The uh, nav system, or not the nav, the, the infotainment display uh, is a little hit or miss. Um, other than that and the shifter, I dare say it's pretty close to perfect. Ooh, those are strong words. There's not much in this car that I really say, gosh, I can't imagine why they did it that way or, oh, they should change or whatever. And that's – most cars I can find something that, is okay. like, I don't get it. So talk about recommended re- configurations. To me, this car in a T6 trim – Inscription it, T6. That's the – Inscription is the luxury trim. Do you really I, – I don't know that I agree with that. I actually I want might, the seats. I want really the massaging the seats. seats. If you're going to spend this much money, I want the massaging seats. Okay, fine. You see that? The man's got priorities. If you don't care whether your seats move or, you know, massage – I think by far the best value points the T6 momentum. You can do art design if you want the cool looking tires or yeah. the best paint well, colors. So the art design, yeah, it's completely stylistic. Let's set that up. There's art design and inscription are about the same. Yeah, they're, well, the, it's just that, a look. It's just it's any of the three trims. There's not a whole lot of optioning difference, with the exception of those massaging seats and the crystal knobbies and you know the the, the superior fit and finish kind of stuff. Mechanically, you're the same leather. Thing. Yeah, again, it's a leather Volvo advisor. to begin with. It's like, oh no, I didn't get leather. Yeah, like, even the stripped down version of this is going to be a really <laughs> nice place to be. If, if you're really nitpicking whether my you know grab handles are got leather trim, yeah. nice problem to have, man. Yeah, <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, even they're all good. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, even from the first time I drove the first XE90, I've I've been in love with it, and if I could afford it, honestly, I would probably make it my daily driver. Um, I, I personally like it better than the XC60 because you do get a whole bunch more oh, room sure. in the back. It's in, between the XC60 and the 90, I agree with you. If it's money's obvious. no object. If money's no object. If money is an object there, and you don't have kids, there's no reason not to buy the 60, I think. They're pretty close. The 60, actually, uh, we talk, we were talking about this earlier, yeah. talking about dynamics driving and things like that. The 60 drives much more like a car, even though it's the same platform. It's got yeah. a lot less weight. It's a lot smaller. Um, and it has the same engine, so it moves better. Yes. Um, this one, though, I will say the uh, air ride suspension is really good. Yeah. Um, and it does have some trick features in the back where you can, like, lower uh, the rear down to the bottom of what the, the suspension can do to, like, yeah. make loading in a little easier, um, which can be a little n- nice because it is a big car. Okay. And so if you have someone who's a little bit more petite. So I'll give you, as a guy, you know, who could consider, I wouldn't $87,000 consider, but I would T6 consider this car. Mm-hmm. Um Things that that I've thought about with this specific vehicle, you would have to want, like, it's got to be a long-haul cruiser comfort seats view. Put a lot of miles on it. Yeah, you got, exactly. Otherwise, I would honestly maybe hold my money a little bit and get a more mainstream something like the Palisade or Telluride Mm -hmm. at 48,000 fully loaded starts to approach this in a lot of ways. Uh, I've thought about this quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Or... You know, for the price for eighty-seven grand, you can buy two cars at forty-something thousand a piece, and you could. Yeah, but if you're the type of person who's going to buy this car, you're probably not thinking that way. Well, yeah, you know, like all right. So let's say even fuel economy is a concern, right? Is this, it <sighs> on a seventy thousand dollar car? Is I anyone caring about fuel economy? I, I don't think it is. No, they aren't. But the, but if that's one of the justifications, what you could have for the T eight, right? Like I just I just don't see the T eight working there. You can buy a lot of gasoline. For the price difference of a T6 versus the T8. You could, but then how would I show off to my friends and, and look down on them for how dot <laughs> green they are? Yeah, I guess so. Until they figure out how much energy it took to build that T8. Yeah, and then they're going to make a PowerPoint presentation to make you feel bad, and you're going to be like, I don't care. It's green. It's great. Um, one other thing that's actually worth mentioning is the heads-up display is really good. Turn off the following distance indicator on the head's display, and then it's really great. That's in here. That's that to there me, it is. Fa- distance alert. I don't need to know that I'm following that guy. You're going to automatically break me and adapt to cruise control me. It, like, you're They're older. They're trying to keep you safe, sir. Well, like, you're 
older V60 does that. It has yes, the your being glowing lighting. LED. Our XE40, which doesn't have the heads up display, it doesn't nanny me like that. But how are you going to know when you're tailgating? When you hit them, I guess. <laughs> I guess. I mean, it's got a really good automatic emergency braking system. It doesn't. Ha I, I hate the nannying on that. It's just. It bothers well, me. Drive more safely. It bothers me. Drive more safely. Turn it off. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, on that note, I think we can say uh, like and subscribe and uh, uh, click the bell, the notification bell, yeah. so that you can get notified when we have new videos up. Uh, and comment and tell us how the Volvo XC90 is not your personal dream car, but instead it's the Alpha 4C. I don't know. Yeah, it's talking about cars that get you really comfy with your mechanic. <laughs> the seats in that car are not the worst. They're not the worst. No. Yeah. Um, so anyway, we'll call it a day. 2020 Volvo XC90 T8 Inscription E all-wheel drive. Yeah. The, the names just get ridiculous yeah. when they're on there. But anyway, uh, we're going to go, I think, get some dinner. Yeah. Yeah. All right. All right. Have a good night. Bye, Bye -bye, folks. Guys.